there are certain like discrepancies between the dominant Western discourse and China's domestic discourse, and I think at least we should bring those two discourses together and carefully analyze what is actually happening, instead of assuming like one of them is correct and one of them is simply liar. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. When we talk about Chinese big tech, it usually sounds something like this. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. We may be doing some other things or a couple of options. Obviously, Kelly, the concern is the security risk here in terms of how TikTok handles user data and whether or not it goes back to China or the or the Communist Party. By 2020, they will have caught up. By 2025, they will be better than us. And by 2030, they will dominate the industries of AI. That's Donald Trump talking about the social media platform TikTok. And former Google CEO Eric Schmidt talking about the rise of Chinese AI. These clips reflect increasingly common narratives around China's tech industry, which is usually positioned in direct conflict with American companies and American values. A narrative of a digital Cold War, whereby the only thing that can stop a rising China is American ingenuity, is deeply self-serving for Silicon Valley and is being used to help them stave off domestic regulation. But Hong Shen says this narrative risks getting the very history and nature of Chinese technology wrong. Hong is a system scientist at Carnegie Mellon and the author of a new book called Alibaba, Infrastructuring Global China. Hong argues that China's tech sector is actually deeply intertwined with the global economy. Alibaba, for instance, was at one time primarily owned by Yahoo and SoftBank. And Western technology companies often rely on Chinese labor in their supply chains, both to build their hardware and to train their AI. She also argues that Chinese tech isn't simply an extension of the state, as Jack Ma can attest. So this us-versus-them arms race narrative, propagated by both Silicon Valley CEOs and the U.S. government, is, according to Shen, fraught, to say the least. This is the first of two episodes we're going to do on China this season. The next one will focus on China's domestic surveillance network and the technologies that are being used to survey and oppress the country's minorities and which are increasingly being exported to illiberal regimes around the world. There are obviously deeply concerning human rights violations happening in China right now, many of which are enabled by technology. And the expansion of Chinese tech into other parts of the world may be cause for genuine security concerns. But framing the Chinese tech sector as simply an adversary to Silicon Valley in the US doesn't tell the whole story. It glosses over just how interconnected the Chinese and American tech industries really are. So here to complicate this story for us is Hong Shen. I want to start with one of the more common narratives around the Chinese state and the internet, which you could broadly sort of characterize as um, the Chinese government fearing the democratizing potential of the internet, built a firewall that allowed them to both restrict information from the outside world and control the information from within China that its citizens received. Um, What does this narrative get wrong about what played out in that early period um, of internet development in China? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, From my perspective and based on my research, I think definitely more and more this uh, so-called dominant discourse around the Chinese internet uh, is become more and more inadequate. Because as you uh, mentioned, like for a long time, we think the only interest of China is to build this so-called inward-looking national internet that is sealed by the Great Firewall. And that is actually unplugged from the international network. Uh, but from my research, this discourse actually um, suffers at least from two major uh, points. Uh, first of all, people have this um, very idealized imagination of the potential 
democratize a power of technology. So they often think that this network technology will free, especially um, the global South countries from authoritarianism. Um, so in this way, they often think that the so-called Great Firewall, the only purpose of that is to contain this like freedom of speech and so forth. But the Great Firewall is not only a political tool. It is also an economic tool to shield the global uh, tech giants from the Chinese market. And this is highly actually related to why China now has a group of globally prominent tech giants, precisely because in the early stage, the Chinese state using uh, such a tool to protect or to reserve its domestic market for its home owned, homegrown tech giants. So it bought it bought the tech industry in China time to develop their own products to then go out and compete with the American tech companies later. Yes. So so for sure, the Great Firewall has its political aspect, uh, political control, but also it is also a economical shield. Um, and on the other hand, I think the second major um, misunderstanding of this dominant discourse is I think it overlooked. China's relationship with the global internet. That is the rise of um, China's global internet is actually being assisted by transnational capital. Uh, for example, we can recall that Yahoo was actually one of the early investors in Alibaba. And in 2005, it actually owned literally 30% of the company. So until very recently, Alibaba was uh, like more owned by transnational capital than, than, than Chinese-owned national capital. Yeah, which is, I mean, it is remarkable when you think about sort of another largely Western narrative that's emerged, which is of the the close proximity and and symbiosis or even control of Chinese tech companies by the Chinese state. Um, talk more about that narrative and how that misses some of the nuances. Yeah, sure. I think that's a great point. So uh, the dominant discourse often often perceives um, China's especially outward digital expansion as a uh, coherent government action. So Chinese state is indeed dictating those companies for their um, actions. But actually, I think this perception is overly uh, uh, simplistic. So we, we often see actually conflicts uh, not only among different Chinese internet internet capitals, but also between um, those internet capitals and the state entities. I think the most recent cancellation of Ant's IPO is a great example to illustrate this point. We've been following the prospective IPO of Ant Financial, the largest initial public offering of all time. All of that appears this morning to be going up in smoke. The uh, Shanghai Exchange, and we also know Hong Kong as well, uh, have both essentially suspended the listing this morning. This um, does come after uh, Jack Ma, as well as other top executives at Ant, had been summoned on Monday uh, to talk to the regulators at the banks. And it also comes after um, a speech that he made on Friday, in which he was highly critical of regulators for not supporting the fintech industry enough. Let's hear more about that, because I, I mean, I look like I think, again, from watching this somewhat naively from the outside, I think that shocked a lot of people, um, people who assumed Chinese tech companies, even if there was some ca foreign capital coming into it, were working in much more close alignment to Chinese policy. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden you have mm -hmm. one of these, one of the biggest tech companies in the world um, and one of the most prominent heads of it seemingly in conflict with the Chinese state. So maybe you could just 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 some framing for our listeners and so what is Alibaba and and what happened there um, over the past year? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, now probably uh, many of us have uh, aware of that Alibaba is one of the most powerful e-commerce company um, not only in China but also in global internet. So Basically, it's a combination of Amazon and eBay, and it also commands through a variety of uh, financial vehicles, like one of the most uh, valuable fintech tool in the world that is so-called uh, 
uh, Alipay, uh, the mobile payment system that is so widely adopted in China and in many Southeast Asia countries. And used for everything, right? I mean, it's it's a, it's a full payment system. Yeah, exactly. So in, in one of my papers, I argue that this is uh, Alipay has become infrastructuralized in China, means people are use it basically as a basic financial infrastructure. Yeah, you've written, I think, that you can't even buy apples without mobile payment. <laughs> yeah, <China>. exactly. <laughs> even even beggars on the street are using um, Alipay to receive donations. So you can see how, yeah, how popular it is. So then suddenly, I think it's actually, yeah, that's another point I want to uh, emphasize that is... Um, um, there is a much needed uh, historical perspective we need to adopt to look at the relationship between internet capitals and Chinese state entities. So if you look at the development of Alipay in the past um, 10 years, there are actually existing a number of conflicting points. So the cancellation of Ant's IPO is only the recent, probably most prominent points in this longer history. So this by no means to say like, Jack Ma has always have a good relationship with Chinese regulators and until recently, that is not correct. So if you look at history, you can see there are a number of conflicts um, and power struggles between uh, Alipay, different entities of Chinese state apparatus uh, and even local governments in this longer history. Then starting from, I think, uh, last year, we, we indeed saw... Um, much more prominent conflicts uh, between Alipay and the Chinese state entities. Uh, in particular, um, there is an event, so Jack Ma stepping out of the line in public criticism of the banking regulators in China. Basically, he's repeating loss of points. He has uh, raised out over the years that the Chinese banking industry is too old-fashioned and needs like digital interrupters, uh, very similar to the discourse we heard actually around the world. Um, so then suddenly uh, the, 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 the upcoming and IPO was suspended by the Chinese regulators. I mean, this is clearly a more global company that often gets attributed to it with more distance from the Chinese state than maybe people were aware of. But you also argue that it's, it's not really a fully capitalist company either. It's so it, it almost feels like it's something different than we're used. It, it's not a state-owned company. I think we we understand as public utilities and those sorts of things, um, or a pure binary private entity. It seems to be some sort of hybrid. Is that is that fair? Yeah, I think there's a like larger background that often being uh, overlooked in the current discourse. That is. Uh, we often assume that China is already, you know, a market economy, but especially the CCP was still um, holding this so-called socialist ideology uh, in its control of its domestic and even um, global uh, expansion. So Alibaba, in many, many cases, it needs to um, not only like act in the direction of CCP's uh, guidelines, but at least it has to pretend, you know, it's uh, uh, like really listen to uh, state regulators in some sense. So if you look at Alipay and uh, Alibaba's uh, domestic initiatives, many of those initiatives, like they're building rural uh, shopping uh, uh, site called Rural Taobao in China, really, really remote areas, try to help um, the rural populations to get rich, uh, to uh, uh, get rid of the, uh, the the poverty, try to help them to sell their local products. Sometimes those initiatives doesn't really make sense for a private company uh, because simply because it doesn't really uh, make too much profits uh, and so forth. But it's part of the political obligations of those companies that needs to be operated in China. And is... I mean, I think the other thing that was surprising to many people about these recent events around Alibaba was that there is fairly robust competition policy enforcement occurring at the moment in China. Mm -hmm. And is is that almost the a reaction to the protectionist policies that allowed these companies to get so large that now the government is sort of worried about their scale and a lack of innovation in the tech sector. So they're they're pushing back against that scale. Is some of them reaping what they sowed with that protectionism? I think Chinese government is really uh, drawing the 
governments all over the world try to tackle the influence and power of big tech companies in uh, its domestic market. So in some sense, it's a shared concern across governments all over the world. Um, I think compare, compared to other countries, especially the US and EU, China doesn't really have a very strong um, anti-monopoly uh, regulations. Uh, uh, implemented in its uh, domestic market. My anticipation is, it might not be correct. <laughs> I'm just, uh, I, my anticipation is probably in the future, there will be a uh, hybrid type of organizations emerge. So probably the government will have some control of the, so I think a government is really concerned about the power and influence of its domestic internet capital because they're simply because they're getting too big. And they are getting too big, partly because what you said, the, the protectionism um, policy. And also, uh, I think we should be aware of the numerous waves of foreign capital. Uh, injected into those companies. So this is why China facing the same problem as the global internet industry, because, you know, they are founded actually by the same type of capital that is very, very short-sighted. They need to get big first. They need to, in order to get, you know, dominant in their own market. So the, those problems, from my perspective, they're global, they're global problems. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the global nature of these companies, too, um, and the global ambitions of the Chinese state. Another sort of broad common narrative is that uh, some of the expansion of these companies, whether it be Huawei or Alipay, or whatever it might be, into global markets, is in some ways part of Chinese foreign policy. And that this is somehow part of a but much broader geopolitical dynamic where the Chinese state is using this technology infrastructure to either gain political advantage or geopolitical advantage globally. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that. And, and maybe first, I know you've worked a lot in this space, so I'd like to sort of get a bit of uh, some of the grounding here. And so, so what is the Belt and Road Initiative and what, are the, what is the Chinese government trying to do there? Um, and then we can talk a bit about how, how technology fits into that. So uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, one of the most prominent foreign policy initiatives in China. Like it was uh, basically initiated by the highest level of leadership in China. Uh, in this case, it's by Xi Jinping himself, uh, tried to connect China uh, through Europe, both uh, through the uh, uh, land road and the uh, sea road. It's similar to many Chinese high-level initiatives. This Belt and Road Initiative is very, very opaque and sometimes uh, uh, intended to be uh, ambiguous. So uh, to allow different government entities and uh, its uh, comp state-owned companies and private companies to have room to interpret this very high-level strategy. And then we saw really because of this is um, concurrent with the rise of China's internet industry, so we saw more and more in the policy discourse, people uh, do talk about um, the digital component of the Belt and Road Initiative, which we often call the digital Silk Road. Mm. And so, so what what are the components of that? If you think of different layers of the technology stack, um, what companies and what technologies are being exported and to whom via the the digital Silk Road? So, um, if we're talking about infrastructure layers, there are three uh, layers. One is um, um, the equipment vendors. Those are Huawei, ZTE, Xiaomi, uh, even Lenovo, and so forth. They are producing the hardware of this digital Silk Road. Then in the middle layer, we saw um, Chinese telecom operators, China Telecom, China Unicom, China Mobile. Those are uh, telecom operators, but they are busy actually in building overseas uh, telecom infrastructures. So both basically those uh, uh, really the hardware of global connectivity. Um, then the, 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 the higher layer uh, is the internet application and service providers. Uh, we just covered like, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Baidu, or, or TikTok. Uh, so those three layers constitutes the so-called digital Silk Road. And, and what do you think is the motivation for this? 
Yeah. Okay. Good. Great question. I think there are a number of motivations. Um. Uh. Basically, the the timing of the digital Silk Road is very um critical. That is, China is facing a serious uh both political and economic crisis within China. Especially, there is a huge industrial overcapacity inside China. Uh. So China needs um some external expansion. Uh, strategies to to use that industrial overcapacities to build uh, different infrastructures in the world. So they need access to new markets, essentially, for the for these companies to say the scale they are and to keep this production capacity. Yes, exactly. So so you're saying it's it's largely an economic driver, is what's going yeah, but- on here. Yeah, but also there's a political uh, uh, motivations as well. If especially if you're looking at the internet aspect of Belt and Road, at the same time there is the so-called um, Snowden uh, disclosed that the spy agency from the U.S. is really uh, spying around the world. Then we saw uh, the like many countries in the global south uh, is trying to build the so-called BRICS cable. Then China was part of the initiative. Then China uh, actually think they and needs a separate uh, a global digital infrastructure that is different from the current U.S. dominated. So that's kind of another like political layer as well. So this is why um, digital Silk Road actually is a very important component of the Silk Road because China needs to build a China-centered transnational network infrastructure for its own development, um, both political and economic. So for a long time, there was a narrative that China's global role was purely in service of domestic priorities. And that it didn't really have any colonial ambitions in the same way as we've looked at other previous powers. Um, They didn't want to change the politics in countries. They didn't want to have permanent presence in countries around the world in the same way the British Empire or the American Empire might have aspired to. There is a different narrative, though, that's emerging um, including in reports from the U.S. Senate and the way the U.S. is kind of pushing a lot of this discourse at the moment, that China also has political ambitions over the countries in which it is expanding some of these digital capacities. And that might mean not just some of this base technology infrastructure, but actually also exporting some of the tools that the Chinese state uses, um, either to survey its population or to control in some capacity its population, um, and if that's the case, that has real political implications in some of these countries. If these are being exported to a liberal leaning regimes, for example, um, how does that fit in? That narrative fit in with this? Is there is there a desire to solidify illiberalism through this foreign policy as well? Mm, that's that's a good question. Um, I don't. First of all, I don't have empirical data to. Uh, to say whether China is really exporting surveillance technology to other countries or not. So, so that's an open question for me as well. I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but I think the, the current framework that is trying to frame, um, China's outward expansion in the global internet as, you know, in internet freedom versus authoritarian surveillance is a little bit inadequate and sometimes even a little bit misleading. Um, because if you look at China's own domestic discourse, um, its expansion towards especially Africa countries was uh, framed as the so-called South-South cooperation between China and Africa, which has a long history dated back into uh, 1950s. So, so there are certain like discrepancies between the dominant Western discourse and China's domestic discourse. And I think at least we should bring those two discourse together and carefully analyze on the ground details, um, empirical evidence of what is actually happening with the China's global expansion, um, instead of assuming like one of them is correct and one of them is simply liar. I think that's that's important nuance there. I mean, I mean... I think one of the way, reasons it gets framed like that is is because some of the statements that have been made around the 
importance the state's placing in AI and in quantum computing and in the real capacity change that could emerge from the combination of those, certainly. Um, and a bit of an arms race emerging with the U.S. in both of those spaces. Um, are, are you concerned about that kind of arms race narrative? Um, the, I mean, these are two potentially very, very powerful and transformative technologies. Um, and in some ways, the, the Chinese government looks better positioned um, to develop both of them um, than, than more open free markets. Is, is, is that true? Yeah, exactly. I heard those narrative all the time, the great power competitions between China and the U.S. in AI. Um, and it makes me concerned, not only because, you know, um, you know, the, the simplistic, you know, portray of both China and the U.S., but also like sometimes uh, in my classroom, when I raise, you know, critical points towards, you know, uh, the, the development of AI, uh, in general, not in China, then my student will will say, well, you know, if we don't do that, then Chinese will be doing that. So, so that's a deeply, very deeply troubling uh, uh, argument. Then I will say, like, it's not like race to the bottom competition, right? Uh, and also, I think it's important to recognize that the development of AI and quantum computing uh, and 5G it's a, there's a globally distributed production chain. So it's not really China is developing this and U.S. is developing an alternative. It's basically all the countries, maybe the, the, at least U.S. China are working together in some areas to develop AI in certain sense. If you look at especially the labor behind AI, the Chinese, um, you know, image labeling workers are actually labeling image for U.S. Uh, uh, AI uh, startups. So it's not really like U.S. versus China uh, in some sense. And I think there's a great opportunity actually for countries to work together uh, to look at the labor resistance and the politics behind AI innovations. Uh, simply because U.S. China are actually facing the same type of problems, labor exploitation, labor resistance. Um, we can do better to, to help those people instead of saying, like, if Chinese don't do that, yeah, if we don't do that, then Chinese will be doing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's an important point here, that there are a whole host of common, um, potentially objectives, um, not maybe not between st- nation states here, but between citizens of both countries. And it, it feels to me like that might be a way in to a more productive governance conversation where exactly. there are some sort of collective global problems that are emerging in this space. Um, but one of the real stumbling blocks in this, in the global governance of AI conversation has really been a, a perception, um, I think, in Western democracies that China will not abide by global governance regimes in the AI space. I'm, and that stems from, I think, a, a really legit, like, a legitimate concern that China has always promoted its own sovereignty over or prioritized sovereignty over participation in active global governance regimes. Um, it, but do you think there's a window of opportunity here? Is there, is there a space for a global governance conversation of these emerging technologies that China would participate in? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. I think as we like mentioned in this uh, chat that China is not a monolithic uh, authoritarian state in general. So there are different divisions inside the state apparatus. And we have critical scholars and critical divisions inside state apparatus as well that they are going to promote a more um, uh, eco, a more uh, uh, human uh, global governance regime as well. If you look at China's Chinese domestic policy discourse, it's much more complicated and richer than we often imagine from a outsider's perspective. So people are indeed uh, debating with each other. So which road should China do? Like which action should China take in the next uh, five to 10 years? And people, there's like very first domestic criticism against labor exploitation behind air industries. As well, so I do think there are some um, like common ground we can build, and, and it's our job as critical scholars to help build those uh, common ground to shape those policy debate, uh, to really critically look at the so-called global AI industries and what can what we can do for the for the people actually who are mostly impacted by those systems collectively. And what would you think? I'm mean, just to close here. I'm curious on that point. I mean, where would you, if you were looking at 
developing certain governance regimes for either AI or data privacy or um, telecommunications regulation, whatever it might be globally, um, where do you think the most fruitful opportunity is for collaboration? So from my perspective, I think labor rights, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the labor behind those tech industries, definitely one of the uh, highest priority. Chinese government is taking some actions towards there. And also, the I think the, the really the center of this podcast is how to regulate big tech monopoly uh, uh, tech companies, uh, both in China and in uh, other countries, will be a very fruitful, uh, uh, like, Conversation. We can build a fruitful conversation over there as well. Because so, it's already happening um, there. I mean, they're already yeah, exactly. doing it domestically, right? Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, look, this is just the start of a much longer conversation, I think. And and thank you so much for for speaking with us. No, thanks for hosting me. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy talking with you. Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> That was my conversation with Hong Shen. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation and produced by Antica Productions. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursdays every other week.